Chelsea Bow. This is Micah Germany and this is Sarah Kirschman. We're students from Libby High School that worked under the direction of Mr. Gene Reckon and our project was the significance of radon level differences of homes with negative air pressure. Little background on radon. Radon is a highly radioactive element discovered in 1899. It is tasteless, odorless, and colorless and is commonly found in igneous rock, soil, and in some cases water. It easily penetrates common household building materials such as wood. There are many health effects associated with radon. Tiny radioactive particles enter the lungs and cause cancerous changes in cells nearby. It's the second leading cause of lung cancer, second only to cigarette smoke. However, exposure does not produce immediate effects. The EPA standard for requiring mitigation for a radon problem is four picocuries per liter in indoor air. Any exposure carries risk and the chances of developing cancer are mostly dependent upon the level of exposure and the amount of time spent in the home that has radon accumulation. Negative air pressure is caused by too much air leaving the home and lack of fresh air to replace it. The tendency for warm air to rise creates pressure differences in the home. This is called the stack effect. This makes the basement pressure lower than atmospheric pressure and it makes it most likely to have radon accumulation problems. Um, there are many household appliances that can cause negative air pressure, such as fans, dryers, and vents, which take air from the inside and vent it to the outside. This causes the house to draw replacement air from any available source, sources, such as cracks or in the floor or foundation. Our, our question uh, was, in similar ho houses provided some variables, does household activity that creates negative air pressure have any significant effect on radon levels versus when there is minimal to no activity at all. Our hypothesis was there will be a greater level of radon measured when activities are happening in the home and when there is little to no activity at all. We also believe that homes with de deteriorating conditions and unfinished basements will have a higher radon level. Our method was we chose 10 homes with similar structures and were all built around the same time and were in the same vicinity within two blocks of each other. Uh, then we gave the residents a questionnaire and that document gave us the ability to document the condition of the home, was there cracks, was there windows, how many windows, and if there are doors in the basement. Uh, we placed the radon detector four feet, five feet from fluorescent lights and four feet off the ground from walls, sorry. And we collected data for five days in these homes in the spring and in the fall. The fall had the most activity due to the weather and in the spring we tried to get as less activity as possible and we gave the residents uh, a entry thing so they could document how much and what is going on in the house. Um, this is a table of our results. Um, each house is monitored by the more activity in the fall and the less activity in the spring with an average of 5.5 for high activity and a low average of 4.7. We also ran a t-test to determine if there was a numerical difference between the two, the two sets of data and our answer was 0 0.4202 and in order for any significant difference to be shown there has to be a number less than 0 0.05 so we cannot formulate any conclusions that our data was significant. Um, this is a graph that shows um, the different correlations between the data. The gray bars represent the more activity and the orange bars represent the less activity. Um, based on the information from my t-test, the, the data collected does not support a hypothesis. 
Our t-test value did not allow us to conclude that there is any significant difference between the radon levels with more activity and minimal activity. Further research is needed to um, make any conclusions. Um, there, the variables that could have had an effect on our data would be the lack of weather changing, causing people to keep their houses buttoned up in order to keep the heat in, which causes more air pressure, and since we're trying to test the negative air pressure, it could have affected our data. And if we were con to conduct this experiment again, we would monitor for more than five days to receive a more accurate reading as well as get a bigger sample size and use different sets of different, like, different groups of home structures to kind of compare them to each other. These are our sources. Any questions? Yes? Uh, T-tests are pretty hard to, to prove unless you have a pretty distinct difference. Yeah. But show me your bar graph again. In how many instances is the less activity orange bar higher than the gray bar? There aren't any. There was one that was actually both times we did the test, they were identical. Yeah, so you might you might want to work with somebody in statistics to see if you can't come up with a way to put that in a little bit more positive with a little bit more positive mm -hmm. spin on it. Because okay. T tests are, are pretty tricky and and uh, they usually require a bigger data set. Um, more activity, we had um, wood stoves running, dryers running, vents, whatever. We had them document what activities they were running. And because of the weather, we ultimately had to have them cut their activity in half rather than just not run them at all. Because of the heat, they had to run their stoves and they had to wash their clothes and stuff. So it's basically just cut their activity in half and document the hours that they ran those appliances. Yeah, we had them mark hourly activity. For activity, did you look at anything dealing with how much windows and doors were open and closed? We did. We had, um, on their questionnaire, we asked them, you know, how many doors are in the basement, how many windows, if so, how often are they used, and we assigned them number values, and we, we kind of had trouble factoring that into our data because um, it was just number-wise, we didn't really know how it affected, so we just, we had the values, we didn't really do anything with them. Yeah, the reason I asked about that specifically over other activities is because the house is basically trapped the radon mm -hmm. inside the structure, or building, whatever, and that'd be one avenue you think of great to be able to reduce those concentrations for the Anybody else? Up. I'm Carly Jessup and I'm Paige Wissenbach and for our project we tested the air quality of burning candles versus wakeless candles. <coughs> the question is do burning candles increase the level of PM 2.5 in the air more than wickless candles? For our hypothesis we thought that more PM2 will be released with the burning candles versus wickless because of the smoke particles released and causing more bad air quality. And um, for our wickless candles, we used a brand called Sensi. This is just a form of a candle that they have a, you plug it into a outlet and it, the light bulb inside it heats up a plate above it and you put the wax on top and it just melts the wax and releases the scent and no smoke is emitted from this. So here's what we did. We had three different trials. Um, trial one was a control group. There was no candles at all. And trial two was burning candles with a flame. Trial three was heating the candles with the Sensi candle. And for each trial, they were tested for three hours with a 10 minute mini control before we actually plugged in the candle. So the results for trial one, um, which was just the control, as you can see, it just, it stayed well below the, the standard EPA, and so, yeah. For trial two, this was the burning candle, and as you can see, 
after the 10 minute mark, it's sparked high. And we think that this is caused by the match that we lit because the smoke that is created from the match. And also because, as you can see, it continues to climb from the candle, actually releasing the particles into the air. This is trial three, the Stentsy candle. And as you can see, it did spark when we did plug in the candle, but for the most part, it stayed well below, below the standard EPA. So it is healthy. Um, when we compared the results, um, as you can see, basically, it just shows that this spiked up and all these, the control and the Sensi stayed below the standard EPA and the candle, which we lit, sparked and then went, continued to climb up above the 200 mark. In con our conclusion, um, based on the information, our hypothesis was correct. Uh, burning candles versus the heating candles created a substantial difference in the air quality. Uh, the burning candles released uh, bits of smoke and soot and that polluted the air, causing the PM 2.5 levels to increase and making it hazardous to the air quality. Um, these results show that the Sensi candles are healthier for our environment and for us to breathe in and smell good. <laughs> So some improvements that we could have done is we could have completed the tests on the same day. We did do them on different days, but at this relatively the same time. And we could have constructed more trials for more results to be more accurate, and we could have recorded them for longer. And also maybe in some different rooms as well. We did this all in the same room. So what's next? From the results of this experiment, we hope to have informed the audience of the hazards created by burning um, candles within the home. The wickless candles emit the desired scent with, without re the release of toxic smoke particles. So, and so by replacing standard burning candles with the wickless candles, individuals can make their home and workplace a safer environment for coworkers and friends. Any questions? because it's what was available to us at the time. The gal who invented Sensi Candles lives in Idaho. You might want to get a hold of her. That could be a good marketing tool. Okay. <laughs> it does kind of sound like an advertisement, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I may have missed it. How far away was your um, readings from the candle? Or the oh, sensi? it was about five feet It was away. the same for yeah. each test. Each time. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> five feet. Go ahead. Do you know what the yellow ball of flame is around the candle? Can you explain? <laughs> yeah, so actually those are glowing soot particles that are inside the yellow part of the flame. There's a thin layer of blue on the outside. That's the actual combustion zone where things are being changed into CO2 and water. But all the yellow stuff on the inside, that's carbon soot that's glowing, so it's not surprising at all. Have a lot of them. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay. Hello. My name is Andrew Smith. I'm Rebel Larson. And I'm William Lee. And we are doing the effects of candles and incense on air quality in the home. We are from Libby High School, and we are under the instruction of Mr. Gene Reckon. Candles are used in seven out of 10 households. Approximately three-fourths of candle users say they typically burn candles for four hours or less per city. We use wax candles and stick incense for an experiment. We are comparing our results with the EPA outdoor standards in our experiment because there isn't an indoor standard set yet. Our questions include whether or not household activities affect the PM 2.5 levels while using candles or incense, and how long does it take for household PM levels to reach the control average? What are the lingering effects of these products on the PM 2.5 levels? 
due to the visible particulate output of candles and incense, we hypothesized that PM2.5 levels will raise significantly during use of these products. Similar, similarly, we predict that activity combined with these products will increase PM levels more so than without. We believe that activity in the rooms will stir up PM and raise the levels. And we base our hypothesis mostly upon personal experience with the lingering effects of smoke from these products. Okay. Here we have a diagram of uh, what we did using Microsoft Paper. <laughs> we used one room in three different houses to conduct our tests. We set the dust track at 4.5 feet above the floor in the room to simulate the average height of someone sitting or standing. The testing products were set five feet away from the dust track at all times while testing was taking place. We had a series of six tests in each room. Our control consisted of no household activity or use of products. And then we did a combined or a combination of tests with candles and scents, no activity and activity. Activity testing consisted of sweeping the floor, walking around the room, and then vacuuming, each activity lasting five minutes. There was a 10 hour time period between sweeping and walking around to allow for PM levels to become relatively stable before proceeding with vacuuming two hours after walking around. In tests that require candles, we burned a modern light soy candle for two hours to simulate the average time that people will have a candle burning in their homes. In tests that require incense, we burned one 11 inch stick of incense for 30 minutes to simulate the average time that people will have incense burning in their homes. As you can see by our graph, uh, overall activity is much higher than no activity. And uh, activity for candles and incense exceeded the EPA outdoor standard for PM2.5, which is represented by this white line. We measured the time it took from the peak until it reached the control for both candles and incense. Even after the candle went out after two hours, the smoke lingered for a much longer time. The incense was only burned for 30 minutes and it still had a lasting effect on the PM2.5 levels. Incense took 14.5 hours, the candles took 12.5 hours to reach the control. In conclusion, candles and incense raise PM2.5 levels above the EPA standards for daily and yearly acceptable averages. Incense affected PM levels more so than candles. Activity does not necessarily affect PM levels while using these products. While using incense, activity dispersed the smoke, leaving the PM levels lower than without activity. The lingering, pro lingering effects of the PM after the candles and incense went out significantly, significantly made a difference in our data. Uh, possible, possible sources of error. Um, there was some uncontrolled airflow in and out of the rooms. In one of the, te the <coughs> testing areas, there was a heating vent system which we were not able to seal which could have uh, skewed our results slightly. Uh, there was some difference in room size and flooring, as well as some of the contents of some of the rooms. One of them was empty because it had just been drywalled a couple months prior to the testing, and others were uh, not unoccupied bedrooms. Uh, the pressure differences between the homes could have also contributed to these variances and changed the PM2.5 averages, mm, and also, Testing across multiple seasons could have had an effect on barometric pressure and therefore negative air pressure in the rooms, generating more or less airflow in the room, and then by through that affecting the PM2.5 levels. These are our references. And thank you for listening and any questions? Yes, sir. In your long-term profile showing the dropping off of the activity, you had a shoulder in uh, both of your traces. Do you have any explanations for what that little shoulder was? Though this is our average activity testing, so those shoulders are actually, that's actually one of the tests we conducted, so that would have been... That would have been vacuuming or sweeping, most likely... Uh, that would have been most likely uh, vacuuming. 
the one of the large spikes, both of them are at the same period of time, would have been uh, sweeping, which um, made it spike quite a bit. Might might help to put arrows with an activity link yeah. to, to show where those. Yeah, that makes sense. So how do you think this compares with smoking within the home? So somebody was smoking the, uh, inside the home. I I'm not sure that. I would assume that it would be similar or worse, uh, and that it takes quite a long time for the um, PM to, to reach the, the normal levels or the control. So I, I would assume that it's, it's worse. Um, one of the things we wanted to illustrate with this experiment is that even after uh, you, if you're burning or, as you said, perhaps smoking, the lingering effects take much longer than people probably predict. So if in the event that, say, someone is a smoker, but they have children come to their household, so they quit smoking a couple hours prior to having someone over. There's a lingering effect, and so therefore, the health, ha the health risks do not end when you extinguish that, whatever's burning. Yes? Um, you said you used a modern light soy candle. Um, how common is it for that sort of candle to be used? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not really sure. Um, we basically grabbed the, the cheapest one at the local store. Uh, <laughs> so um, I'm certainly quite, quite a few people using it, but uh, that's a good question. That, that would take some further yeah. research. You might try using different varieties of candles to see if that messes you up. Yeah, uh, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to say, I remember a study from the University of Utah where four cigarettes generated 675 in a 10 minute period. So, for comparison's sake. Which, which would take a long time to go back to back down, I'm sure. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. What was it that you said at the beginning? Something about seven out of ten households? Um, it was right in the background. Yes. Uh, candles are used in seven out of ten households, yes. That's, no that's, statistic like that with incense, though? Uh, no, we couldn't find anything with. Uh, with incense, that was, that was more difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, we tried, did try some customer reviews when we were in the beginning stages of planning our experiment as far as what we would use for products, and uh, <coughs> they yielded uh, not, not very valid results for what we should use, and incense users are kind of a particular crowd, so <laughs> that we won't be able to really find a one name brand that was more popular than others. <laughs> what is the kind of brand that you use? <laughs> Obviously, people who are testing to see how bad it makes PM 2.5 levels. <laughs> Good answer, right My name is uh, Andrew Harris, this is Penny Vang, and Robert Thomas, and we'll be talking about air quality in new versus old house. So our air quality project is determining whether a newer house has a better air quality than an older house. Our question is, does the air quality of the house change depending on the age, location, and whether pets are in the house? Our hypothesis is the newer house will have a better air quality than the older house, as well as the house located out of town and the house without pets. We started by finding the age of the two houses, the location, and which house does not have any pets. A dust track machine will be placed in one of the rooms so we could collect the samples on the second and last weekend of the month. We located two houses, one is in town and one is out of town. The house out of town is newer and has no pets, while the older house is in town and has pets. The results of the total average for the newer house is 0 .042 p.m for a particular PM 2.5 levels. The results for the older house is 0 0.044, particularly. Um, yes. okay. So when comparing the two tables together and the total averages, you can see the averages for both houses 
is significantly close to one another, but when you take out Thanksgiving Day, it becomes down to 0 0.015. So therefore, it shows that the newer house is, is lower quite a bit than the older house. The old house versus new house, this graph shows the averages of the overall project. We took the averages of the averages, maximum and min, in this graph. We included Thanksgiving, that's why the graph, or the cluster of graphs to the left, the blue is higher. Otherwise it would be lower, like we said, down to the point zero one five. Next. We concluded that the newer house has a lower air quality PM 2.5 in the air than the older house where the pets played a huge role. We also found that the location is a contributing factor for the new house was out of town where the old house was right in the middle of town. Thank you, are there any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, I think you're justified in, in removing the Thanksgiving Day data. It was probably most restrictive. Yeah. If you wanted to have even a, a firmer leg to stand on, in statistics there's something called a Q test that you can use to throw out one data point if it's substantially different from the others. Oh, okay. So you might want to look at a Q test. Okay. Please. Yes, Mr. Jones. Notice in your uh, comparison to the one show the hours and the other can you repeat that? I didn't hear you. Your old house was showing at hours. Okay, so um, that was because we had a, uh, we ran into a problem when we were doing the data. Um, the old house was, the data didn't record correctly for uh, the days that this one was doing all the way up to a little past Thanksgiving, I think it was. And so that data we uh, had to then go back and so we did multiple times throughout the day so we could still get more data to compare it to. So that one's why it's in hours instead of days. But those are all on the same day, I think it was. Yeah. Yes. So you've got three variables. Your, uh, whether or not they have pets, whether the house is old or new, and the location of the house. Yes. So how would you tease apart those three contributor, or potential contributors to well, if we wanted to isolate each variable like on its own, uh, when we originally started out, we had planned on doing a new house with a new house, one that had dogs in it, and then going about it that way. But then after about a week or two of like trying to find enough houses to do it, we started running into the problem of not having enough houses to do it. And then it turned out that we still had a house that was completely new, no dogs at all and out of town, which was Canoe's house, and then we had uh, Robert's house that did have dogs. It was older and in the middle of town, so then we still wanted to stick with the question, and it still showed like significantly from 0 0.015 to 0 0.044 that it was, that those factors did play a huge role in it. Yes? Um, you mentioned older and newer houses, so do a cutoff construction day or, or occupancy, or how you decide what was well, Robert, how old did you say your house? Oh, uh, early 70s, like 72. Was when it was started constructed to be lived, and yeah. built, finished. So. And then, Canoe, your house was. Um, I only know the age, it's like about 20. Yeah, so her house was closer to 20 years old, so late 90s. Early 90s was about when her house was constructed, and so we just based it upon that. Any other questions? We did uh, vehicular air quality. We go to Corvallis High School, and our teacher is Mr. Hamill. So our question was, does the air quality change in a vehicle when the car heater is turned on? And our hypothesis is, if you turn on the heater, the car, the air quality in the car will change because of the fresh air being circulated. The procedure was we had uh, five minutes 
just control in the vehicle. And then after five minutes, turn the heater on and uh, repeat the process. Don't open any windows or doors. Don't, don't like, turn on the air conditioning or mess with the heater. Just keep it constant. These are the four vehicles that we tested. Uh, 88 Dodge Ram, 88 Ford F-250, 94 Ford Explorer, and then 08 Ford F-250. This is uh, the Ford. Right off the bat, it starts out really high, way above the uh, outdoor average, which probably not good. And then the minute the heat turns on, shot up, and it just kept gradually rising over the period of five minutes. Then we have the Dodge. Once again, it started out just really high, stayed pretty constant, and then the heat turned on. Had this spike right here. I got kind of bored, turned on the music. Subwoofers kind of rattled some stuff around, so. But after that, kept gradually going down, which is, that's good. The Ford Explorer, it started out really low. Had this spike, I, I have no idea what that was from, but it just kept gradually going down, and then when the heat was actually turned on, it didn't seem to make a difference at all, just some more random spikes in there. And then the 08 Ford, it just did great, like, whole time. Very good air quality, way below, way below the average. Heater didn't seem to make a difference at all, so we have asthma, probably want to buy a Ford. <laughs> so our results are uh, the air quality gradually had less and less PM 2.5 after the heat was turned on in the 88 Dodge and the Ford Explorer. In contrast, the amount of PM 2.5 went up after the heater was turned on in the 98 or the 88 Ford. And lastly, the 2008 Ford remained constant, uh, other than a few random spikes. So the conclusion was like. Uh, the air quality isn't really affected by the heater. It was in the two oldest vehicles, but there wasn't enough consistent data to suggest that there's going to be a difference in every car. But what we did come up with is the older the car you have, worse air quality you're going to have in it. So buy a new car if you have asthma and you're sensitive to smoke and other stuff. Don't buy an old car that's going to like leak oil into the heater or something and kill you. <laughs> Uh, things we could have changed was test more vehicles, uh, test the vehicles in the same weather conditions, and do a longer test. Probably not turn on the sub. Don't listen to music if you're bored either. That messed up our results a little bit. And uh, that's the end. Any questions? If you Well, uh, waited about a minute, just getting in, kind of just getting the little thing set up, all that. Both all the cars I tested had been daily drivers, you know, so that none of them had been sitting around in a field rusting away. So they all were pretty fresh. Are they with the subs? Are they with the subs? They weren't that big, but <laughs> two six inches, just big enough to like disrupt the back of the seat, get some dust and stuff flowing in there, probably some cleaner from cleaning the seat. So were these tests done while the car was parked? It was running. Uh, the car was parked, but it was running the whole time. So then the next question is, uh, what would the outside of the uh, the, they they kind of varied the the ninety four and the two thousand eight. They did those in the morning, and then the two older ones I did later at night. I'm thinking the outside uh, air quality could have affected it. Maybe just the air getting in there in the first place was bad. But I'm kind of kind of hoping it's just the cars that are just awful and that new cars have much better air quality. <laughs> Yeah, go back there. Uh, probably not. 
just because I, it's not like I was sitting in there revving them up there all just idling pretty pretty constant unless unless the exhaust was like coming right into the cab I don't think it'd be a problem all the exhaust pipes were your exhaust pipes were like yeah they're all fine exhaust pipes so no exhaust leaks there that didn't throw it off at all were the interiors of the cars the same or were they uh, I can tell you that all my stuff was pretty clean. There was not a whole lot of dirt in there. The trucks were all single caps, and then the Explorer, it was uh, long. It, had, it was pretty clean in there. Material? Uh, let's see, no. The, my, the newer Ford was leather. The two old, old trucks were uh, cloth. What was, and the Explorer was cloth. And then the Explorer was cloth, too. So. That could have affected it, maybe. Yep. I don't know my trucks very well. Were these all gasoline fueled vehicles or were uh, some of them diesels? They were, yes, they were all gasoline. None, none of them were diesels. Uh, what about sedan fueling acid trucks and SUVs? Yeah, that's, that's all I have. I don't have any sedan. You're also only testing American brand cars. Once again, all I have is American cars. <laughs> I tried not being biased and just using Fords and Dodgers, but can't help it. That's all I have. All right, good job. Hello, my name is Ezekiel Carlson, and this is my partner, Caitlin Reitzma. We're from Libby High School, under the instruction of Mr. Gene Reckon, and our project was on how heat recovery ventilators affect PM2.5 counts within the home. There has been an increase in airtight homes in recent years due to a desire to conserve heat. Lack of ventilation causes PM2.5 and other air toxins to accumulate within the home. One solution is the heat recovery ventilator, also known as the heat exchange ventilator. The heat recovery ventilator retains heat while removing air toxins. It draws and filters clean, cool air inside and pushes warm, toxic air out, as shown in the top picture. The clean, cool air and the warm, toxic air pass through the exchange core, shown in the middle picture, where the two samples of air don't actually mix, but rather pass by each other in close enough proximity for the warm air to preheat the cool air. The bottom figure shows how the warm air and the cool air pass by each other without mixing. Through this process, up to 85% or more of the heat from the warm air can be retained. The question that we were seeking to answer was, does operating a heat recovery ventilator reduce PM2.5 levels within the home? If we turn a home's heat recovery ventilator off, we hypothesize its PM2.5 counts would be significantly higher than when that same home's heat exchange ventilator is on because PM2.5 would not be being filtered out, it would just accumulate. We also hypothesize houses with heat exchange ventilators will have a lower overall PM2.5 count than houses without because PM2.5 won't be cycled out, it would just be trapped inside the home. The way we went about this was we placed two PM2.5 dust track monitors within one home with the heat recovery ventilator. We did two tests in two days. The first test, each were 24 hours. The first test was with the heat recovery ventilator on, and the second test was directly afterwards with the heat recovery ventilator switched off. We compared this data with the, we compared the data with the heat recovery ventilator on versus the heat recovery ventilator off. We then went on to collect data from homes with no heat recovery ventilator. We compared this data with the heat recovery ve ventilator on and the heat recovery ventilator off data. This graph shows the heat recovery ventilator on data versus the heat recovery ventilator off data. The blue is the on data and the off and the red is the off data. As you can see, the when the heat recovery ventilator was on, the PM2.5 levels were higher than when it was off. This is another graph comparing the, th the averages from the three. The, on the left is the heat recovery ventilator on average. In the middle is the heat recovery ventilator off average. And on the right is the homes with no heat recovery ventilator, and that's their average. 
as you can see, the homes with no heat recovery ventilator falls in between the heat recovery, heat, heat recovery ventilator on and the heat recovery ventilator off. We, perf we performed a t-test on two aspects of the data to find out if the info information was viable. Results at or below our chosen alpha of 0.05 mean we can draw conclusions from the data. When we compare the heat recovery ventilator on data against the homes with the heat recovery ventilator off data, our result was 0.189. When we compared our heat recovery ventilator off data against homes with no heat recovery ventilator, our result was 0.61. Our t-test results show that our data has no relationship and we cannot draw conclusions from it because both t-test results were over 0.05. Further testing will be necessary to prove anything, but the data suggests that heat recovery ventilators increase PM2.5, which is not what we predicted, and then homes with long-term heat recovery ventilator use have a lower PM2.5 count, which is in line with our hypothesis. ways that we could improve our experiment would be reduce the variables between the homes. There was structure differences, there was, a f we had, most of them were two level houses, but we had, I think two homes were one level, so that might have played a factor, and age. They were, all the houses were within 10 to 15 years of each other, but there are differences in the ways homes are made between the years. Uh, location. There were some that were down by a river. There were some that were um, out near a golf course. There was just different outside factors that could contribute to that. And then difference in home activities. Some, the way that people heat their homes in the winter. Some have wood stoves and some have heating systems that reduce, redu that, that don't put out any PM2.5 particles. Um, Ventilation system differences such as vents, ductwork, and um, we to prove our hypothesis true uh, to prove or disprove our hypothesis we would need a larger sample size approximately we would need to do 90 houses. These are our references. Any questions? Each of these tests is 24 hours. The heat recovery ventilator on, that's 24 hours. Each of them is 24 hours, but we switched the heat recovery ventilator off, and that's the one in the middle. Does that answer your question? Does that answer your question? Um, one of you. <laughs> <laughs> what was your sample size then? How many houses? Um, we had five homes with no heat recovery ventilator and six homes with a heat recovery ventilator. It was hard to, to find a large sample size because not very many people use a heat recovery ventilator because it is a fairly expensive system. I was wondering what the outdoor air was like because when you have the HRV on, you might be reading your outdoor air quality rather than indoor. With heat recovery ventilators, they are run through a filter before they exit or are in, taken into the home. So is, that a, is that a HEPA filter? I'm, I'm not completely sure what kind of filter it is, but I know it would remove most of the PM2.5 with the air that it's sucking in. Yes? Did you by chance try and figure out if the PM2.5 level increase came from the fresh air vent? Like, did you take the dust track right to the fresh air vent and see if the air coming right into the house is clean and it's just a kick up of dust in the house that's already there or if it's actually bringing in new PM2.5? We, we just tested the, the overall ambient air. We didn't take it near any to, to any of the vents. The vents are generally 
on the, uh, near the ceiling, and we didn't have a way to attach the monitor to the ceiling, so that also would have been fairly difficult. <coughs> Are there any more questions? Hi, my name is Gala Catino. This is Rachel Tillman, and that's Julia Michaels. We're from Big Sky High School, and our teacher is Mr. Jones. Um, our project was to compare the air quality in all of the different chemistry rooms in the high schools. Um, for our project, we tested the difference in air quality of the chemistry classrooms at Hallgate, Big Sky, and Sentinel. Um, the purpose of this project was to determine which high school chemistry classroom has the least amount of particulate matter in the air and therefore the best air quality overall. We hypothesized that the chemistry classroom at Hellgate would produce the least particulate matter because the classroom was on the second floor, therefore separated from the other classroom that could affect the particulate matter. Furthermore, this chemistry classroom was fairly close to the breezeway, which increases airflow and circulation. We also hypothesized that the air quality of the chemistry classroom at Big Sky would be the worst because of its location in the building. The classroom is located in the main hall of the building, and Mr. Jones told us that the classroom is not empty all day due to independent studies and students studying in the classroom. There are no windows or doors to the outside, which we believe cut off ventilation and make the air stagnant. For each classroom, we set the air quality machine in the morning and let it run for 24 hours, collecting data the entire time, and then we retrieved the machine in the morning and collected and analyzed the data. Okay, the first um, chemistry classroom that we did was Mrs. Henthorne at Hellgate High School. She teaches chemistry one and two. This is the graph um, for the data that we collected at Mrs. Henthorne's classroom. And during her prep period, there was little to no activity, but the particulate matter spiked during her first chemistry class. And this was a chemistry two class, and there was a lab um, being performed during both chem two classes, and those were second and third period. And there was a steady decrease after 11 a.m. Um, interestingly, though, there was a larger peak at 4 p.m. And we think this could be due to a janitor cleaning the room or Mrs. Henthorne uh, prepping for a lab the next day. This sums up the data. Um, the next school we did was um, Big Sky High School. Due to an unknown cause, there was a drastic increase in particulate matter around midnight. The particulate matter was increased from 5 until midnight. It then decreased and remained more or less constant until noon the next day when it dropped dramatically and then increased again starting at 4. We infer that the air quality changes are due to a fan being um, set to turn on and off at noon and midnight, which would explain the drastic changes occurring at these times. Um, for Sentinel High School, we looked at Miss Linda Smith's chemistry room. Here's her graph. There was a big increase from after lunch around from 12 to 4, and it leveled off till around 7. And then, oh, there was another spike from 5 to 9, probably because they have an air ex exchange machi machine, so when it turned off, the particles were reintroduced into the air, and it probably took a while for them to settle down again. And after nine, the particulate matter decreased until school started again the next day at seven. There was a small spike, but then the air machine was turned on, so things got more leveled out. Then at noon, kids like to use her microwave in her room, she says, so we figure that's why there's another big spike at noon. And that sums up the second data. These are our results, which are more clearly depicted in the next slide. So we came to the conclusion that due to the uh, peak at Hellgate being at 0 0.026, the largest peak at Big Sky being at 0 0.007, and the largest peak at Sentinel being 0 0.02, uh, Hellgate and Sentinel were relatively similar. For most of the time, they stayed uh, constant and around the same average, as you can see. Um, but Big Sky, the lowest peak was at 0 .0001, which is a lot lower than the other two high schools. 
And so our hypothesis was disproven because we thought that Big Sky would have the uh, worst air quality, but in fact, it had the best air quality, and Hellgate had the worst. And these are our um, sites that we went to. Thank you. Are there any questions? I yes. you mentioned the situation with Hellgate where it was located in you know, Big Sky. Sentinel kind of a, in the middle sort of scenario between those two. Sentinels, if I remember correctly, if anyone goes to Sentinel, they can correct me, but I think it was n the location of the chemistry room. Yeah. It was in a part of the building that was far away, more or less, from like the main group of classrooms. It was close to a big door where people enter a lot, and there was the like, I don't know, Sentinel's coffee cart nearby or snack bar. Yes. Now, at, at Big Sky, there's no windows, but it's it's got the common corridor in between the lines of classrooms. Is that got a suspended ceiling such that you could disperse any particulates out over a larger area, or is there a a structural ceiling that would hold things in? I, I don't really know what the. Uh, well, the chemistry classroom that we were testing, um, it has a door connected to the main hall, which is um, the largest hall in the school, and then it also has a door that's on the other side that goes into a smaller hallway, and I'm pretty sure they all have different heights of ceilings. So. Uh, I, I just wondered if there was a suspended ceiling so that there was actually a bigger reservoir in which to disperse things. Um, I think it is suspended. I think it has ceiling tiles, and then there's a big area up above, um, if that's what you're asking. Right. Did you uh, test these all on the same day, and uh, did you test the air quality outside and outdoors? Um, no, they were tested on different days, and we didn't test the air quality outside. Um, they were done at different times of the year as well. Algate was done um, in the end of February and Sentinel was done in the beginning of February, and then Big Sky was done in April. <laughs> Hello, uh, I'm Colton DeShazer, and this is Robin Kais, and we, uh, our experiment was the human activity effect on radon levels in the home. We're from Libby High School and in the instruction of Mr. Gene Reckon. Uh, radon gas was first discovered by Ernest, Ernest Rutherford in 1899. Uh, during the medieval ages, um, Austrian uranium miners were known to die at a relatively young age due to uh, lung complications. Thank you, you want to click? Radon is the second leading cause of lung cancer in America, uh, right after cigarette smoke. Uh, uranium decays quickly, giving off radon gas, which when inhaled, uh, breaks down in the lungs, damaging the lining, uh, which can lead to lung cancer. Uh, radon is defined by three zones of exposure. The EPA, or, yeah, the EPA recommends that mitigation, recommends mitigation with levels of four picocuries or higher. Uh, zone one is indoor levels greater than four picocuries. Zone two are indoor levels between two and four picocuries. And zone three are levels less than two picocuries. Uh, the national average is 1.3 picocuries per liter, which is different than Montana's, which is 5.9. Uh, there are only seven counties in Montana that have zone two radon levels. The rest have zone one and they're known with zone three. <clears throat> Our hypothesis was that regular activities in the home would increase the cumulative radon gas. Uh, things like opening and closing doors, uh, running like your dryer or your <coughs> range hood would increase this due to negative pressure. Uh, that's because like the stack effect, which creates, where's my point? Uh, like the stack effects, which creates a negative pressure down here because the warm air is rising. Uh, things like your 
dryer forcing air out or a range hood or a fan, it forces air out which create a negative pressure where heavier radon gas is forced in through cracks or faults in the home, which then it settles in the lowest part of the home. The basis for our experiment was to test how the radon levels, our radon gas levels, were affected by regular home activity. Uh, regular home activity would be anything that may create negative pressure, running vents, uh, range hoods, etc. Um, uh, dryers and home heating systems that do not have independent, oh, that's the same thing, sorry. Uh, to do this experiment, we found local residents that were going on a multiple week vacation and placed monitors in the lowest level of their home while they were gone. Once they returned, we would place a monitor back in the home in the same location and test again while they were going through their regular activities. Uh, this is a chart of our data. Uh, our original hypothesis was only supported by house two. Uh, we kind of had an oddity with house one. There was only 0.1 uh, difference in Pico Curies per liter. That was because while they were gone, they left their heating system on, unlike the other homes. Uh, they had house plants and stuff, so they left it on, which I assume kept air flowing, which really there wasn't much of a difference. Um, house four does not have homes with occupants because they were so close to getting home that we couldn't input their data by the time we had to send our PowerPoint to the here. Um, out of our five houses, we couldn't really conclude a definite conclusion just because we were subject to such difficult, not many people go on two, three week vacations. <laughs> so it's kind of subject. Uh, revisions would be, do it, we need a longer time to get more homes to be available. And is Montana a problem? Remember that it's an average and it's indoors. Test your home before you say, oh no, Montana, I need to move out. Uh, thank you, these are our pictures and info and whatnot. Uh, any questions? Yes. Uh, just one thing I'd like to mention, uh, my information on this is a few years out of date, so I don't know if it's accurate anymore, but part of the reason that there's a Zone 2 area in Montana was due to lack of information, lack of data. Ah. So, uh, I don't know if that has changed since the last time it worked on the radon, which was in the mm -hmm. late 1990s, but something to think about it, or be aware of. Yeah, I don't know for sure I, yeah, when the data was collected for that. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yes. So if you... Uh, have your clothes dryer in the basement, uh, that's going to force indoor air out. Whether it's pumping the air out of the basement, is that something that you would view as good? If radon accumulates in the basement? Do you want to know? I, I never, I didn't really, that's a good question. I had not, no, I didn't know that one. I don't think yeah, so, but, but if, if you have a zone one house, what they try to do? to uh, mitigate the radon problem? Uh, first have it tested and by a licensed professional and then usually the mitigation professionals are have the equipment and they would know they would have the tools to do that. Typically it's increased ventilation. Yes. Sometimes you try to do it beneath the foundation mm -hmm. but anything you can do to stir up the air from accumulating in the basement I think is, is good. Yeah. Is that right then? Uh, Basically, uh, there's some things you have to be aware of. I mean, if you're still creating that negative pressure in the basement because you're higher up, so you can still be sucking radon into your foundation mm -hmm. and gases from through there. So, so it's, it's a little complex. The most common way to mitigate radon, radon, radon excuse me, is the one in the slab if you have a basement type house. But you crawl spaces, it's a little more complicated. Yes. So I have a question for Ben. So does the health department have uh, testing available? Uh, testing right kits. Uh, they're commonly available in hardware stores. Uh, health department sells them. Uh, they're fairly simple to do and very accurate. As long as you follow the directions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How was your vacation? <laughs> uh, 
We didn't go on vacation. No, you went on a two or three week vacation. <laughs> we, we found people in the community. Uh, I wish I had gone on vacation. Let's just say that. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? All right, thank you. All right. So we did, um, we're from Big Sky High School and we tested the industrial education classrooms at our high school. I'm Mackenzie Westfall and this is Dakota Wilson, <laughs> middle name Thunder. <laughs> and our teacher's David Jones. Yep. So well, we, hy we hypothesized that <laughs> There will be a direct co correlation between air quality and the quantity of industry in a given area. And our procedure, we placed the dust track about four feet off the ground on a level surface. And we sampled while the rooms were being used. And we had a sample time of 10 minutes for each room. We sampled the kiln room, our wood shop, and our welding room. And these are Graphs. All right, this is the result for the wood shop. Uh, anytime there's a spike, that's probably when something was being cut or worked with, and that caused a disruption with sawdust into the air. Oh, and the average was 0.146. Uh, this is the kiln room, and this was while clay was being fired, but not while it was being glazed. And this is a very inaccurate graph because the spike is actually a time period of a few seconds where we decided to hold the sampling machine next to the exhaust. So uh, point source solution. This is a more accurate graph of the kiln room. We took out any outliers that would have messed up the graph. And uh, it's a very well ventilated room. So it actually has fairly good air quality compared to the other rooms. And this is the welding room. Again, this was while class was in session. And this was a fairly uh, polluted room. I don't take welding, so I'm not sure what kind of chemicals are in the air. But any time that metal was being cut or welded, uh, that caused a disruption, and therefore it caused pollution. So we concluded that when examining our raw data from the three sample locations, the kiln room appeared to be the poorest air quality, but after removing all confounding variables, we realized that it actually had the best air quality, and the poorest air quality was found in the welding room, followed by the woods room, and then the kiln room. So yeah, that's our confounding variable when Dakota here, not me, decided to hold the tube up to the exhaust on the kiln. And we chose to do this experiment because we want to show how industry is directly related to poor air quality, even on small scales like in our schools and our community. Any questions? Yes. Um, with the exception of the noted outlier, how far was the um, dust track from the activity that was taking place in the, in the kiln room? Yeah. Uh, the dust track was placed directly on top of the kiln, which was about four feet, five feet away from the exhaust. And like I said, the kiln room was very well ventilated. It had an open door, and it was actually placed outside. Yes. You mentioned removal of outliers. Is that only the data you receive from holding the collection tube near the exhaust, or is there other elements that you're removing as well? No, as far as that room went, there wasn't much room for anything messing up. It was only probably a square footage of 12 feet. So there wasn't really anything in the room that could have messed it up other than the location of the dust track, which we only moved once. Interesting. Kayla. I don't like Outside, the outdoor air quality changed your results. Yeah, definitely. Because, I mean, we had the door open, so the weather outside was like overcast. We had, we tried to close it off as much as we could. We closed one door unless the other door like cracked open, but you're not really supposed to be in there with both doors closed because it gets really hot, so Mr. DeGrandapu wouldn't let us do that, but. 
the outside, yeah, would definitely affect it. Yeah. Uh, what units were used on the graphs? Okay, let's go back to graphs for a second. Uh, the x variable or the x axis is the time frame over a course of 10 minutes, and on the y axis is uh, PM 2.5 particulate matter in micrograms. Yes. I'm going back to your graphs when you were saying that the spikes probably, this spike probably might have been caused by, did you also keep a log at the same time to see what was going on? We had a uh, written piece of paper where we were just like taking notes of things that going on around us. Like when someone would like cut a piece of wood or when, I don't know what it's called when they fire the welding, but like when something like that would happen, we had little tallies and we'd mark down like the time to try to compare it to our graph. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hi, I'm Mac Rackard. I'm David Stevens. Testing, testing, one, two. Is it, am I supposed to press uh -oh. the one? Oh no, oh no. Did we get it back with <laughs> Start over. Try this again. I'm David Stevens. And I'm Matt Dracker. We go to Corvallis High School and we guided through the journey through air quality on the wings of Mr. Hammond. <laughs> now, before we start, do we have any bacon lovers out there? Nice bacon lovers. We're going to get along just fine. Whoever raises their hand, you can stay. <laughs> now, we would like to present Bacon Fumes and you. All right, the purpose. Everyone cooks bacon, but the thing you love most can't it hurt you with increased levels of PM 2.5. Oh God, please no. <laughs> we want to see this, and we want to see if there's any differences in between cooking store-bought bacon or a locally cut bacon at, at a butcher, butcher shop. So our hypothesis is that that locally cut bacon, because it's local, is going to have cleaner air quality than the store-bought bacon with all those you know, preservatives and stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so what are you going to need for materials? You're going to need a pound of store-bought bacon, a pound of locally cut bacon, you're going to need a kitchen, you're going to need a dust tractor, and you're going to need an electric stove and two good-looking scientists. That's right. <laughs> so here was our procedure. Before we started cooking, we had the machine running for five minutes to, you know, get the air quality in the room. Then we ran, we cooked bacon, each of them for 30 minutes. All the windows were closed, so all the particulate matter got into the machine. First, we cooked all the store-bought bacon on the electric stove. Both were at medium heat. And then when we were done cooking, we, of course, ate it all. But then we opened all the windows and waited until the air quality had cleared to its original level. Then we repeated the process with the locally cut bacon. These are our results. As you can see, pretty uh, similar in correlation. The spikes, I assume, were increasing overall flavor in the kitchen due to the bacon. <laughs> but overall, uh, you got pretty high up there, and not too good level of air quality you got going on. Yeah, you see that little bottom purple line by the zero? That's the, that's the EPA standard. So, <laughs> so well, you got to make sacrifices for this good bacon. Yeah. And also, we had our graph a lot of in um, micrograms instead of milligrams. Tell me which one's that, the store bought. The store bought is the green line, and the local is the blue line. Oh, yeah. I'm the conclusion right here. The conclusion. So, contrary to our hypothesis, the locally cut bacon, well, it had a little worse air quality than the store bought bacon. It spiked over about 10,000 micrograms from here. Well, well, the store-bought bacon spiked over 9,500 9, micrograms per meal. We recorded a t-test, and it's not, it doesn't really show a correlation because of, probably because the test samples were pretty small. So it also means it's kind of similar. So you're probably wondering why this happened. Well, we think the locally cut, the locally cut bacon had more fat content than the store-bought bacon, and that was released during the oxidation process of cooking. 
So more fat content, more particular matter. Improvements we could have done. Well, we could have tested more brands of store-bought bacon in different locations. We also could have cooked it in the oven instead of on the stovetop. And we also could have tried frying it, compared to those. Questions? Sam. Um, so the locally cut bacon had um, higher levels of PM 2.5 in the air. Just now, barely. OK, but is that necessarily a bad thing, considering the torque sort of PM 2.5 that bacon releases? It's not necessarily a bad thing. Mostly the increased levels were due to the fat content. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yeah. You. How close was the dust track to the A couple feet away. Yeah. Two or three feet. Yeah, two or three feet away. You. Do you feel like exposure to an extra 500 micrograms of PM2.5 is worth the extra deliciousness of mostly it's locally bought bacon compared to the Absolutely. Of course. <laughs> I don't make any sacrifice for this bacon. <laughs> yeah, so, um, you. Did you do all your testing in the same time? Um, two 30 minute periods. And they're. Yeah, it was the same day. Do you think that might have skewed the same day? What? Is this the same location? Same location. And same day? Same day. <laughs> You. This was just one test, but we had a lot of bacon. <laughs> Wait, no. Never enough bacon. That's right. Over there. Uh, you were there at first when this experiment was going on. So your dust track was about two feet away. You're basically in the plume, that sounds like, with the bacon exhaust. What do you think the results would be on the other side of the kitchen? Well, you see, by the time we were done cooking, the house was, there was literally haze across the entire house. <laughs> I mean, there was a... So, Delicious bacon haze. Yeah. So, uh, I'm thinking that even if it was farther away, it still would have got pretty similar results just because the haze was evened out through the entire house by the time we were done. Delicious bacon smoke throughout the house. Yeah, it was a good day. It was a very good day. Was that? Well, no, because we waited before we started our next experiment until it was the exact same level as the first one, and we also used a different frying pan for the second one. Okay. Mm. Anyone else? All right, next nice <laughs> Okay, so that is it for the presentations. And before lunch, we are going to recognize your judges, uh, judging panel by site. <laughs> so we are going to call the, the judges up one at a time and recognize them, because um, some of them have to get out of here and can't stick around for lunch. So with that said, um, let's see. Who are we? So Miss Nancy Mara, would you come up, please? Okay, uh, Dr. Woodall. <laughs> Heidi Miley. <laughs> Russ Thomas. G Wiz. Yeah. 
and Ben Schmidt. judges real fast. So is Marcy here? scores. This is your judges up here. So. <laughs> no. One more round of applause. They've really taken their time out. So let's have some fun now and let's give some prizes away. First thing we're going to do is we are going to recognize the people that make this happen, namely your teachers. So how about we invite down Mr. Dave Jones. So Dave has been a part of this program since the very, very beginning. And eight years, nine years, still going strong. So Earl's big in the group hug, so just be careful out there. Um, so Mr. Brock Hamill from Fort Valley. So Brock has been a part of the program for six or seven years now also, so he's made one of the mainstays with us. Um, Mr. Gene Reckon from Libby. Gene is another one of those that have been around for a while with us and the partnership continues. So Kate Dirksen from Sentinel High School. So Kate had one student this year and hopefully next year we'll have 30 or 40. Yes. Thanks Kate. So let's give our teachers one more round of applause. Cassie, come on down. So I don't know if you noticed, but it's how uh, great the timekeeping was today. So just an outstanding job by Cassie with her holding up the signs and taking pictures. So this is Cassie, Cassie Mo. So now we're going to give away the first, second, and third prizes for the posters. And Marcy McNamara is going to announce the winners. OK, I'd just like to say that all of the posters did a fantastic job. And including everyone who was called out as the top six, everyone answered questions wonderfully. And we had a really hard time choosing the top three and even within the top three who got first, second, and third. So without any further ado, in third place, we have the poster called Dead or Alive with Kate Hoffman and Lacey Alsip from Corvallis High School. <laughs> and 
And if you didn't get a chance to see it, the dead or alive refers to the burning of dead versus alive pine needles as measured with a dust trap. Thank you, ladies. So in second place, we have the poster titled Effects of Woodworking on Air Quality. That's Austin Heron, Nick Johns, Lawrence Nijin, and Austin Weiss from Big Sky High School. place, we have the poster titled, What Types of Bee Smoker Fuels Produce the Most PM2.5 Particles When Burned? It's a poster by Coulter Zimmerman from yeah. Coulter Zimmerman. And he is a sophomore. So we look, we look forward to his future posters and presentations as well. Congratulations, everybody. again this year. So let's start with third place. From Libby High School, significance of radon level differences of homes with negative air pressure, Chelsea Bow, Micah Germany, and Sarah Kirschman. Second place from Corvallis High School, air quality of different methods of making popcorn, Casey Stewart, Elizabeth Hennessy, and Courtney Albright. Toxic Symposium from Big Sky High School. Difference of particulate matter at roundabouts and stop controlled intersections. Kyle <laughs> Bresco. If you want a tour of the University of Montana, Cassie's going to meet you guys uh, outside at f in five minutes if you're interested in that. Thank you.